Uh, this morning we're going to be looking at um, Revelation 14, 1 through 5. A few weeks ago, our brother Larry did a, a sermon on Revelation 6 through 12 on the three angels message, and we're going to be looking at the character of God's people in the last days. So let us begin with a word of prayer. Dear God in heaven, we're so thankful we are here this morning to rejoice in you, Lord, to celebrate you, Lord, to give you thanks and praise for all that you've done for us. And this week with the snow, we are more appreciative than ever of the warm house that we live in and, and uh, people that go out there and clear the roads for us. And we should always be thankful for people who are willing to make our lives a better place and a more comfortable place. But more importantly, Lord, let us every day be able to thank you for giving us everything in our life. And may we be grateful to tell others our story about you. In your name we pray, amen. All right, well, what we're going to first look at is I want you to turn with me to Genesis 49. Because what we want to look at, we want to look at is how this is kind of all put together. In Genesis 49, what you have here is Jacob is very old, he's about to die, and he wants to give the blessings to his 12 sons, the 12 sons of Jacob here. And he wants to do this to let them know what their future holds and what, they, what things are going to be like for them. And there's some notable verses that we'll look at with this, Genesis 49. And it begins here, and Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what will befall you in the last days. All right, so what we see here is a kind of type of 144,000 here with Jacob's sons. These sons were to go out and they were supposed to evangelize the world and tell people about the coming Messiah, about the Savior of the world. And of course, as we read in the history of Israel and of these 12 sons, it didn't quite work out the way it should have here. But we are given some notable things about it. We are seen in verse 10 where it talks about uh, the tribe of Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. It references that Jesus would be coming, that the coming Savior, the coming Deliverer would come. In verse 16, it mentions here, Dan, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider shall fall backwards. And of course, what we will find is between this time that we are seeing this in Genesis to the time of Revelation 7, Dan is removed as a tribe because of his idolatry, his tribe's idolatry, and is replaced by Manasseh, who is the firstborn of Joseph. So we see that happen, and we see a descriptor here that sounds an awful lot like an example of the devil when, you know, he bit the heel of Jesus, but Jesus crushed him, crushed him there. And then we see that uh, in verse 25, we read about Joseph, and it's an elegant description of Joseph. By the God of your father who will help you, and by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, and blessings of the breast and of the womb. The blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors. Up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, they shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. All right, and so we know that about Joseph. Joseph was a type of Christ, and Joseph was a representative of what Israel could have been. Here was Joseph, who was sold in slavery by his brothers, who suffered a lot of hardship, was thrown in prison, and then was to become the second in command of Egypt, and was to be able to bring his family into a good land, into a good land, and he was always blessed because he followed God. And so we see here in Genesis 49, kind of a precursor to what was to happen, that God's people, God's people always were to be a people that would go out and shine the light of God to the whole entire world. 
And then we go to Revelation chapter 7. Go to Revelation chapter 7. And what we're going to look at in terms of Revelation 7 and Revelation 14, as it is talking about 144,000, is that it gives a descriptive of both um, the 144,000 in earth and the 144,000 in heaven as well. And we see in this first part of Revelation 7, and we're going to go to the other part later in the, in the message here, it says here, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and the winds should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. And then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sailed the servants of the living God, the servants of God, on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, in this sermon today, we won't be talking about that distinction that most of Christian belief is about the literal Israel. That's another sermon. As a matter of fact, in March when I preach again, I'll be talking about Israel in that way. But this answers the question that says here in the end of Revelation 6 here, where it says, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, Every slave and every freeman hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? In answering the question, who is able to stand, we have Revelation 7 that tells us about 144,000, the people who will be living in the last days who are God's people. And that answers that question about that. So we will read about more about that later on. Now go to Revelation 14 now. This is going to be our emphasis, Revelation 14, 1 through 5. And again... Here, it starts off with, an, with the earth here. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion. So they're here on the earth. And with them, 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So we're going to break this down now and look at the characteristics of God's people in the last day. <coughs> so it begins here and talks about that there is the Lamb. Okay? Jesus is described as the Lamb. He is the one that died for our sins. He was sacrificed. It was his blood that was shed. And it says that this Lamb is standing on Mount Zion. The meeting of God's people is there. And it tells us in that first characteristic that the Father's name are written on their forehead. Because they not just believe, they don't just believe, but they live to tell the world. There is going to be a separation of nominal Christians. There's going to be a separation of people who say that they love Jesus, but they don't really follow anything in their life that reflects that. This separates it. This is an exclusive club of those who are living in the last days. Okay? And it says that they have their name written on their forehead, their father's name written on their forehead. They have encompassed God so much, they are devoted to Jesus. Their actions, their thoughts, their motives are completely decorated uh, in their forehead, in their mind to represent Jesus of who he is. 
It's not anybody else who may say they're religious, may say they believe in God, none of that. It says these ones are really devoted to the God. And it says that there's a voice from heaven, voice like thunder, talking about God's voice, Jesus' voice, and they sing a song that nobody else sings. And if you remember the descriptive, when Moses and the people crossed the Red Sea, and they looked out into the sea, and they saw all of the dead of the Egyptian army laid across everywhere. And they had made it across. The water came back in and, and just encompassed all of his army. And they were relieved, and they looked back on that and saw, he saved us. He saved us. And they started to sing a song of salvation. They started to sing a song of salvation. And God's people, these 144,000 who are living in the last days, they sing a song that only they can sing, that only they can know. Um, look how Isaiah describes it. Isaiah 26. Let's turn to that. Isaiah 26. And it tells us, in that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation, God's people, the nation you replace with people. Because nation is ethnos. Okay, in Hebrew and in Greek, it's the righteous people. All right? That the righteous people which keep the truth may enter in. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you, trust in the Lord forever. So the first descriptive is this people who have their father's name written on their forehead. The second characteristic of God's people who are living in the last days is that they are redeemed from the earth. In other words, these are people who are redeemed. They have been set free. They know God, and they have been separated. The wheat and the tares, all of those descriptives that we are given is talking about those people who will remove themselves from thinking in terms of the way the world thinks and will be a people with a new song in their heart. They will be, have gratefulness about salvation. They will understand the value and the, and the gift of salvation and the gift of being redeemed. They will understand all that God has done for them. And they will have three char characteristics that Revelation 12, 11 tells us about. Because in Revelation 12 and 13, it starts getting into the thing about the Antichrist and about the enemy being drawn up very clearly. But it says about God's people that, number one, they will be covered by the blood of the Lamb. In other words, every aspect of their life is covered by the blood of the Lamb. They know that whatever they do, whatever they say, their motives and what's going on in their mind, that they need to be covered by the blood of the Lamb because they know only He can protect them, only He can save them. A second characteristic is it says they have the testimony of Jesus. They're obedient. They listen to what the Word of God has to say. And they don't try to change it to or compromise to fit their lifestyle. They're going to follow the testimony of Jesus and be obedient to what Jesus says for them to do. And finally, the third characteristic, and again, you can find this in Revelation 12, 11, is that they love not their lives to the death. There will be nothing to them more important than following God. They will love their lives unto the death. If they die for God, they die for God. It was Thomas who was the doubter who says, well, you know, I'm not going to believe him until I look at him and I can touch him and I can feel him. And then later, he's the one that says, let's go. And if we die with him, we die with him. And so that really is a nice separation of the people living on this earth of those who say, I will die for God. Because there will be many who won't die for God, who won't totally sacrifice for their Lord. They value salvation, and they never take it for granted. And they understand three areas of redemption. 
that they have been given. There is a redemption of the past, there is a redemption of the present, and there is a redemption of the future. And you can look at this, if you turn with me, as an example of this, 1 Corinthians 11. So go to 1 Corinthians 11, and we're going to begin here in verse 23. This is a description about communion, okay? A description about communion. Look what it says. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and says, Take it, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we see that God is telling us all of your past sins, you have come to communion and you're breaking this bread and I want you to eat it because I've taken all the sins from your past away and I've redeemed you from all your past sins. You don't remember them no more. I don't remember them no more. They're gone. They're, they're taken away. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is now, present tense, the new covenant. The new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So he says you have the present day redemption. That every day as you get up, you give your life completely to God. You cover yourself with the blood of, the Je of Jesus. And every day God is forgiving you and helping you and guiding you to understand the value of redemption that he has done for you every day in present tense. And we have that. And then it tells us, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup in the future now, you got a future redemption. As often as you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes in the future. That you will remember the redemption that God is going to give you for the future. For everything that will go on in your life in the future. He knows how your life is laid out and what will happen in your life, good, bad, and indifferent. And there is a redemption that we feel for that, that God got us, us covered. He's got us covered in our life for the future, and he will give us that redemption as well. It's not stopping at the present tense. It didn't stop in the past tense, and it will continue on to the future tense. And communion is all about that. It is all about coming to God and saying, Lord, I for forgive me, Lord. I want to be clean. We have the foot washing, we have the communion, and we got this communion, communing together, being together and understanding as brothers and sisters a unity that we must have, a real unity that we must have. We don't just say it. Can't just say it. You have to believe it and you have to live it. And it warns us, verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drink in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself. Drink judgment to himself not discerning the Lord's body. So it's a special time. You have to be right with God. You have to understand where you're standing with others around you and among you. And you don't want to participate in an unworthy manner. And so they see and understand the 144,000, these three areas of redemption as well. And then it gives another characteristic that they're not defiled by women. They are virgins. They seek the truth. They seek purity in their life. They live the truth. They're not just seeking the truth, but they want to live the truth. They take the obligation seriously to follow the truth. No false doctrines, no compromising for their life, 
but to live with truth all the time. And they're not going to be led astray by other kinds of false doctrine. They're not going to be led astray by what other people think or doing. They're going to be true to God. And then that follows right after that with the next characteristic. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. You know, I remember when we were kids and my brothers and I would play um, follow the leader. And, you know, I was the short one. I was the small one. Always have been and always will be and everything. And they would play follow the leader. And what they would do once in a while with me as they followed the leader was that we would go by ditches and things like that. And we would have to jump off to get to the other side. Well, they knew with my short legs that I couldn't do that. I couldn't jump. And so I would always end up getting my shoes muddied and wet over a stream or whatever, or a ditch that we have like that. But you follow the leader. And this is what this is to me, is reminding me, that we will follow the Lamb wherever he goes. We're going to allow Jesus to lead us every day in our life, wherever he goes. If he's in the temple, we're going to follow him there. If he's among the people, we're going to follow him there. We're talking among the people on the outside. Jesus never just stayed in the temple and said, well, I'll wait for them to come to me. He went there, he gathered around them, and he was always around them, healing, comforting, nurturing the people. We follow Jesus in love, in spirit, in actions, just as he touched the untouchable, and he was there with them to show them that you can touch the untouchable and you'd still be okay. He socialized with the outcasts. He socialized with the sinners. He socialized with the unpopular. He wasn't afraid to talk to the unpopular. He wasn't afraid to talk to people who other people shunned. That was not Jesus. He socialized and made friends and made sure he was friends with everybody, not just for the people who were popular and that, uh, that liked to get along with him. But he warned, too, because when we follow the Lamb, wherever he goes, there's a warning. He told one sinner, don't repeat your sin unless a worse thing will happen to you. You've been cured. You've been healed. Don't repeat your actions or unless a worse thing will happen to you. He told a woman, look, your condemners aren't around. I don't condemn you. Sin no more, though. Make sure that you make a conscious decision <clears throat> to turn around your life, to change how you've been going. You can't be doing this. You were caught in adultery. Don't get caught in adultery again. Don't get caught in a mess that you can't get yourself out of. Make a decided decision to follow God and to stay away from this. And he also warned, judge not lest you be judged. Don't look at someone and say, well, you know, that's a bad person. And so we need to stay away from them. They're a bad person. We don't need them around us anymore. He says, don't judge them, unless you be judged. And gave a clear warning of this. But when he did all that, he did this out of love. He did this with love. Which is, and the evidence we see of that is we can look at the book of the Acts of the Apostles and we see all these Pharisees, all these ones who were trying to trap him, all of the ones that were trying to kill him, all of a sudden realizing after he had gone and risen up to heaven, they said, you know what? He was the guy. He was the Messiah. And the book of Acts is a demonstration of how many of them turned to Jesus and realized who he was. They saw that. They knew and understood that. He always opened the door and left the door open for all those who were unpopular, all those who had sinned, all those who may not always be favored by other people, and he left the door open for them because he loved them. And if we are to follow Jesus wherever he goes, to follow the Lamb wherever we go, we must do the same. We must have that characteristic to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Then there was the characteristic they were redeemed from among men. It's a minority that will be chosen, brothers and sisters. We know that. That on the people that are living in the last days. Here we are, 2022. And you know, we're already into the 
we've already completed one twelfth of this year of 2022, right? We're in February now, okay? And here we are. Time is moving quickly. And whether he comes in 2023 or 2033 or 2032 or whatever, it says that the minority will be chosen as 144,000. That's a symbolic number, brothers and sisters. Don't go by that, that there's 144 people. You know, I mean, that would be lousy numbers, huh? Out of millions and billions of people that will be living on the earth when Jesus does come. We're right now, I think, at 8.6 billion people on this earth. And I don't know what it will be when Jesus comes, but it will still be a minority of people. And that means that a lot of churchgoers aren't going to be among them. A lot of ministers are not going to be among them. Philanthropists, as much and as wonderful good things that they did in giving their money, are not going to be among them. And ordinary people who just lived ordinary lives and didn't hurt nobody, they won't make it. Because those that were redeemed from among men, again, value the redemption God has given them. And they have a grateful heart. And finally, I think this is the most distinct characteristic of the 144,000. And it comes last because I think God wanted to emphasize this. And in their mouths was found no deceit. They are without fault. In some version it says they were without guile before the throne of God. That means that they are at peace with all men. They have confessed all of their sins readily, including any secret sins. They wanted to get that removed from their soul, from their heart, and they want to be right with God. They will not be going to heaven with any hate, any resentment, any grudges. Those are going to be removed. Now, I do understand that there are some cases of people that are not able to go to other people and ask for forgiveness. But we can always, whether we can meet up with someone or not, we can forgive. We have that within ourselves to be able to do this. Look what Psalms 15 says about it. This is a, a, a text from David here. Psalms 15. And it tells us here, it's uh, subtitled, A Psalm of David, The Character of Those Who May Dwell with the Lord. Psalms 15. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who gets to hang with you forever or eternity? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised. But he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He's clean. He's pure. And his motives are as good in private as they are in public. He is someone who loves God and he wants to be able to be among God's people. Now we turn to Revelation 7 now. We saw descriptive, hold back the winds until but the servants of God are sealed. And then we are taken into heaven now. Just like in Revelation 14, it start in earth and it enter into heaven. We see in Revelation 7, it starts on earth and it goes into heaven. And this is it starting in verse 9. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one can number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne. They're in heaven now. And before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. 
and crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Imagine that. All of God's people who have lived on earth that know God and knew God and understood God now are there in front of the throne from all nations, all generations and all. There's some, be some people there that we're going to look up and say, man, that guy's tall, you know, from the early part of this world. And it tells us they're clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. They look across at the throne and they look at God and they look at the lap and they say, you are responsible for us being here and our hearts just is bursting with gratitude. We're bursting with gratitude. And all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their face before the throne. You know, we all fall on the face. There's all this humbleness. They fall before the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. And you need to think about it. The four living creatures and the angels that are all around there, they are looking at Jesus in a much higher way than ever before because he brought in these people who have been redeemed from the earth, who have gotten salvation because of his sacrifice and what he did. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these? arrayed in white robes. And I don't know if they're going to be actual white robes or if now we're going to be cloaked once again with the cloak of holiness around us. Either way, it's fine with me. Okay? But it says here, who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? Where did they come from? And I said to him, sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. Keep that in mind. They came out of the great tribulation. They faced the great tribulation. They lived through the great tribulation. It is a lie when you have ministers tell you that we'll be up in heaven watching down at the great tribulation. It's a lie. Clearly, the scripture tells us we're coming out of the great tribulation. We experienced it. We saw it happen. We saw the seven plagues take place. We saw the destruction. We saw the chaos. We saw the death. But we came out of that. All right? We came out of that. And it says, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They understand. These people gave themselves to God and they were covered by the blood of Jesus and we're welcoming them, them into heaven. They qualify. They're fit to be here with us. And they will sit with Jesus. He will be dwelling with them. And we're not jealous of that. We are glad for that. We are glad that he's going to be the new Jerusalem. And then it talks here of our very simple needs here. Very simple needs. They shall need neither hunger anymore, nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. He stays our shepherd. He stays our Lamb. He stays our High Priest. He will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And finally, we're there, and it says, and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. Amen. We will have a relief from pain. We will have a relief of the things that we had to go through on this earth that were sad, that were mean-spirited, where people hurt us, People try to destroy us, and we'll be relieved from all that. We came out of tribulation. We were awarded with these white robes. 
Our focus is on Jesus. And now, with unflinching devotion and concentration, we'll serve God because our tears will be wiped and we will now have a peace and a joy and a contentment. And you know how it is when you have tears of sadness. You cry for a while, but it relieves you, doesn't it? You gotta cry for a while and then you get a relief. And then when you have tears of joy, you're happy. It comes out of you. It bursts out of you because you're so grateful that you are there in heaven and serving God. Thank you.